I wasn't on my own. So thank you for singing. We're going to sing that song um, at the end of our, our service as we just respond to communion. Uh, good, morning. good morning. Welcome to church this morning. It's great to see everybody here with some returnees this morning, which is great to see Kathy here. Um, and if you're joining with us, um, either online or here in the, in the church building, you're really welcome. My name is Peter Bovlin, the minister here in Isle McGee. And we come together to worship God as a church people. A church is made up of people of you and I this morning. And we, we might find ourselves asking the question, what is our purpose in life? You may have asked yourself that question in days gone by. But what about God's purposes? What do we find in the Bible about God's purposes? Well, God's people, you and I, are right at the center of those purposes. Part of God's purposes is the creation of the church. You, the people of God. Right at the end of the Bible in Revelation 21, we, we read these words. It's quite small, I apologize, but Revelation 21, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Part of God's purposes is to create a people and for God to dwell with those people, with us. And as Paul reflected on God's rescue plan through the cross, as he writes the book of Romans, as he gets to chapter 11, he comes to this conclusion of praise. As he has thought of God's rescue plan throughout the book of Romans, he, he writes this, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. God's purposes in bringing together his people, you, the church, caused Paul to say, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. And as God's people today, through the wonder of God's purposes in the cross, we come to sing God's praise as his people. And we're going to do that as we stand to sing, Come People of the Risen King. Let's stand together. Oh, 
boys and girls, I see some of you out there. Come up to the front just before you head out the kingdom. Kids, we're going to have a really quick little chat and pray and sing. But you come up to the front. I'm going to need your, your help in a little bit. Oh, come over this way. Come over. Come, come on. There we go. Anybody else come? Charlotte and Julie are coming. Brilliant. And Ethan and Ruby are going to come. Excellent. Oh, Alexander. There we go. Brilliant. How are we all this morning? All right. You all right? Oh, good. That's good. I don't feel so much on my own this morning. You see, there's, there's some very scary people just sitting right behind you, aren't there? <laughs> all the elders at the front of the church this morning. It's great not to be on my own. I encourage you any Sunday morning. Come and sit towards the front. It's um, lots of fun up here. Now, there's a word that I often use to describe our church. I have, to, I have to be very careful not to use it. There's a word that I use. I, there's a, I'm trying to think, have I used it already this morning? I'll give you a clue. We are all part of one. And we might be part of a small one. And I hope you might think that you're part of a big one as well, Sarah. Family. Yeah, I use the word family when I'm talking about our church, the people here, because the Bible tells us that we are God's family. Now, I need to just maybe think before you answer this question. What do your families do? What do your families do together? What do your families do? Can you think about what you might do as a family? Anybody? Sarah. Um, eat dinner. Brilliant. Very important. We eat together. What else do we do? Sarah. Movie nights. Movie nights. We do fun things together. Connor, what are you doing? Have fun. Brilliant. And there's so many different ways in which we as families can have fun. What else might we do as families? Anybody think back to half term, and I'm looking at Ruby and Ethan here. What did you guys do as a family at half term? Do you remember? Do you remember? No. Sarah. Are you talking about Halloween? Yes, yes, when we were off on, on holiday at half term. Tater Park. Oh, you went, did you go to Tater Park, did you? Where was my invitation? <laughs> and did you have fun at Tater Park? <laughs> Brilliant. You travel and have fun. And I know Ruben and Ethan went to Scotland to visit family. So we travel as families. We eat together. We play together. We travel. I hope also when you think about your families that you might help each other together. You might do things together. Maybe your mum or dad might help you with your homework. Yeah. We help each other. Might you help your mum and dad with housework? No. Okay. I hope you might but we help each other, we play together, we travel together, we eat together. Now, one of the most important things, now, this wasn't mentioned, actually. What's one thing that you do at the dinner table together, Sarah? So we eat together. What else, what else might you do, Connor? Pray. pray together. That's a really good one, and we're about to come to that. But there's something that we do at our dinner table that th lets us or helps us think about prayer. Callum. Sit down. Sit down. Good one. And what else do you do when you sit down? When you're not chomping food, what might you do? Uh, talk about what you're praying for in the prayer. Brilliant. Talk to each other. I hope that all our families, maybe at the dinner table or on the settee or sofa or in the car traveling, that we talk to each other. And Connor has jumped to the correct answer. That one of the amazing things that we can do as a church family is talk to God together, that we can pray to God, which I think is absolutely amazing that we can talk to the God who created the world. And that's what we're going to do now. But I was hoping that you guys might help me when it comes to talking to God. Because some of the things that we, we want to praise God, we want to thank God, and we want to ask God, what are some of the things that we might be able to praise God for in our prayer? Praise him that he is, Sarah. Wonderful. 
wonderful, brilliant. And I'm going to open it up to the congregation because you're all dying to answer this. What might we be able to praise God that he is? Provider, Provider brilliant. Anything else? Faithful. One last one. Who wants to give me one last one? Isaac. With us, brilliant. There are lots of things that we can praise God for. What might we be thankful to God for this morning? Sarah. Food that we eat? Anybody else? Something that we can be thankful to God for? Christ, was that? Oh, his grace, brilliant. Thank you, Sean, brilliant. God's grace to us. And one last one, someone from the back. Be bold. Or not. Something to praise God for this morning. Or thank him. Sorry, I've moved on. How about we thank him for our families when we're thinking about families? No. So we're praising God. We're thanking God. But also when we pray to God, we, we can ask God for maybe situations that are going on in our families that are difficult or in the world around us. What might we want to ask God for his help this morning? Can anybody think of something we might want to ask God or pray about, or ask God for help? Holly. Thank you, Holly. So to ask God to look after all those little babies in Gaza who are in a really difficult, difficult situation. I mean, pray for Gaza and Israel and all that's going on there as well. Thank you. Sarah. For peace. For peace. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. I know there are some people who might be doing some exams. <gasps> In the coming weeks, some of our older boys and girls, so we'll pray for them. Anything else that we could, we could pray for? Sorry? Health. Health. Brilliant. Because there's some people in our church family who aren't well today, and we want to pray for them. So we're going to praise God, we're going to thank God, and we're going to ask God. And we're going to do that all as a church family. Now, you know the way we always do the prayer drill? I'm going to encourage everybody to do the prayer drill this morning because we're a church family. So we'll do the, the hold out our hands, clap three times, one, two, three, and we're going to close our eyes and close our eyes and talk to God. Father God, we praise you that you are a marvelous, wonderful God, that you are gracious to us in so many ways, that you are loving and that you're a God who loves each of us. And we have so much to give you thanks for. We give you thanks for this church family that we are a part of. We give you thanks for our families, for our mums and dads and grannies and grandas and brothers and sisters. Father, we want to thank you for all the food and things that you provide us with. But Father, when we think of all those things that we can be thankful for, we are so mindful of those people who don't have as much as we do, Remember those little babies in Gaza who are in really difficult situations. Father, we pray that you would keep them safe. We pray for peace in that part of the world today. We pray for great, courageous, and bold leaders. And we pray for your peace in hearts. But Father, we also want to pray for maybe our, our older boys and girls, our teenagers who have exams in this week and next couple of weeks. Father, we pray that you really help them as they revise and help them to remember all that they have revised. But Father, we want to also pray for members of our, our family, our church family, who aren't well today, who are really sick, maybe at home or in hospital. Father, we pray for their families as they care for them, and we just leave them in your safe arms. So Father, we want to thank you for your grace to us in Jesus today. And pray, Father, that you'll be with our boys and girls as they head out to Kingdom Kids, that they would take time to learn more and find out more about how amazing Jesus is. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Brilliant. Now, we're going to sing a song that is all about Jesus. We've been learning this song over the last number of weeks. And it's Jesus is the King ruler over everything. And each of the verses tells us more about Jesus' life. So do you remember the actions, do you? Jesus is the king, ruler over everything. Jesus is the one, promised one, the son of God. Jesus is the Lord. He's the one we can't ignore. Jesus, Jesus, he's the king. Will you make sure I'm not doing the actions on my own?
maybe. Let's stand and sing. Kingdom Kids, and we will see you all later on. Brilliant. Just as the boys and girls head out, just some announcements. Hopefully you maybe saw, found some uh, or saw some of the, the scrolling announcements before the service. Just an invitation to re- join us again tonight here in the church, seven o'clock, for what is a relaxed service of praise and prayer and sharing and communion. Um, You'd be really welcome to that. We were really encouraged as we met um, back in September for that. Seven o'clock tonight here in the church. Um, on Thursday night, just a reminder um, to our congregational committee, um, we'll meet at 7.30 in London Halls on Thursday night. Next Sunday afternoon, here in the church at 3 p.m., we have our Seeing Jesus in Dark Times, a service for those who have been bereaved. We ran it for the first time last year. Um, we felt people benefited and, and, and from that service. And again, there's an open invitation to everyone even those members or people not connected with our church family, maybe people in our local community or other churches, if you think of somebody who you think might appreciate and benefit from the, the service, um, it is a, a shorter service, um, some refreshments afterwards, um, three o'clock next Sunday afternoon. And that service is open to, to everybody to come and be a part of that. There, there are a number of opportunities that we're going to speak about over the coming weeks as we come to Christmas, opportunities 
to give. Um, we're very aware that at this time of year, we all have, have different um, things pulling at our, our, our time and our, and our finances. And so we give you these opportunities, um, asking you that you might consider. There's no pressure whatsoever. So over the, over the next number of weeks, you're going to hear about different opportunities to, to, to give. I mentioned this last week. Next Sunday, we're taking the opportunity to bring um, opportunity, or things for a Christmas hamper through Whitehead Storehouse. So specifically Christmas items, crackers, Christmas biscuits, Christmas sweets, those types of things um, for a Christmas hamper. So they'll be collected next Sunday morning. Um, you'd be very welcome to, to bring items if you so wish. You may also have noticed this pin board lit up with lights at the front. In recent years, our PW have facilitated us facilitated us taking part in the Samaritan's Purse shoebox appeal. Many of you have been kind and generous in the last number of years and done that. This year, PW have come up with a slightly different opportunity to support Samaritan's Purse. You may have noticed that the pin board and pinned to it are envelopes with suggestions of gifts from the Samaritan's Purse Christmas gift catalog. And the gifts range from five pounds to 28 pounds. There's blankets, solar lights, hygiene, kits and the pin board will go on me here this week and next week and the idea is that you can come up some people you'll have noticed some gaps some people have already been up pinch some um, to come up take an envelope um, see what um, that gift is and, and maybe return it in the next number of weeks and we're going to put a cut off point just for the appeal on Sunday the 3rd of December and then that money will be passed on those gifts will be bought online um, and as as ever, there's no, no pressure to contribute, but this might be another opportunity this Christmas to, to give for others. In the coming weeks, there'll also be opportunities you'll be hearing just about our own um, church finances and the opportunity you might want to give towards that. And also every Christmas, we have the World Development Appeal as usual. So the different opportunities that you may wish if, um, to support. Again, there's just that opportunity to join for refreshments after the service um, if, if you might want to do that. You'd be really welcome. But just we're going to continue in our worship. Um, we're going to turn to Matthew 16. Our theme over these last number of weeks has been seeing Jesus. This morning we're thinking about the confession of Peter and some verses that will lead us into sharing and communion um, a little bit later on in our service. I'm going to ask John to come and read to us from Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 to 20. Yeah, thanks, John. So a, a reading from Matthew 16, beginning at verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. 
Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Amen. But it's the sermon. You can take a seat, Jesus. I know I didn't give you one. <laughs> Do you keep your, your Bibles open. We're, we're going to take some time now to look at these verses together. We're going to look at them in, in light of sharing communion. And just a little bit later on, in our service, what might we find in these verses that potentially shape our, our time of reflection, our confession of faith, our repentance, our thanksgiving, our commitment as we break bread and drink wine together? When, when faced with the question, who do you say Jesus is? Very few of us, if any of us, will face any serious consequences, depending on how we might respond to that question. But there has not been and continues, and that has not been and continues not to be the case for brothers and sisters in Christ who live in countries where they cannot openly follow Jesus. They face persecution for their faith. And I remember reading a book in my younger days called Jesus Freaks, that made an impact on me because it was filled with stories of those who had been martyred for saying that they followed Jesus, saying that Jesus was Lord of their lives, believing that he was the Christ. And even though we may not face the same consequences, that question is still vitally important for us to both consider and answer who do you say Jesus is? And in discussion around Jesus' question of who do people say I am in Matthew chapter 16, it's Peter who speaks out. It's Peter who goes against the thinking of the crowds. He speaks out with what has become known as Peter's confession. His confession of what he believes. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter is saying, Jesus, I believe you're the Christ, the anointed king, the Messiah, God's promised rescuer. I believe you are the son of God. Now, when you step out from the protection of the crowd or the group that you're a part of, when you go out on a limb, it's encouraging when you are affirmed in your step of faith. And Jesus' words in verse 17 affirm Peter in these incredible words of his confession of faith. Jesus says this in verse 17. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by the, my Father in heaven. Jesus accepts, he affirms Peter's declaration of who he is. Jesus says to him, you're right, Peter. I am the Christ. I am the Son of God. And a key starting point for any of us in our relationship with God is how we answer Jesus' question, who do you say I am? 
And as we considered the Transfiguration last week, we thought about the importance of this question. And in fact, there's no more important question and answer for any of us when it comes to spiritual things. That this question and its answer is pivotal to the relationship with God that the Bible speaks about. And Peter's confession of faith clearly lays it out for us. There's no other answer that speaks of true faith than you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this is the answer that Jesus says God revealed to Peter. As we come to communion, in a few moments, I think there's an opportunity for us as bread and wine are distributed as we eat and drink, to afresh confess our faith. To share Peter's confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then the silence to pray, to say, Jesus, I believe you are the Christ. I believe you are the Son of the living God. I believe you are the Messiah. I believe you are God's promised rescuer who died to save me. We have an opportunity in our communion to, to share Peter's confession. And this confession has big consequences in our lives because not only can Jesus be our Savior, but he must also be our Lord. And we can certainly be praying that Jesus' Lordship will extend across every element of our lives. Sharing Peter's confession as we come in communion. I think the picture of Peter that is painted throughout the New Testament, I think, is it's realistic. It's a helpful one when it comes to us as we seek to follow in his footsteps of faith. And these verses of Matthew 16 give us a, just a snapshot of the bigger picture of Peter's life because it tells us that Peter hadn't got everything sorted, but he still sought to step out in faith. He steps out in faith declaring Jesus to be the Son of God. And yet in a few verses later, we read in verse 23, Jesus rebuking him, telling him, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. Just tells us Peter didn't have all the belief pillars in line. He was still on a journey of discovering who Jesus was and why he had come to earth. And I think Jesus' words of response to Peter are vital to each and every one of us. Wherever we are in that journey of faith, Jesus says that God had revealed to Peter these amazing truths of who Jesus was. That God is the one who grants faith and belief. And I wonder today in these moments if we are still asking questions of who Jesus is if we're struggling to put it all together, if you have doubts about your faith as you face challenge and trial, if you still have questions about the cross, ask God to help you. Ask God to give you belief in Jesus. Ask God to give you the faith that you need. Because he is the good and gracious Father who delights to answer our prayers. He delights to give us good things, and there's no better thing than faith in Jesus. So firstly, we've had this confession of Peter that we can share. And secondly, I don't usually always do all C's, and I've got four C's for you this morning to help you learn. So the first one was a confession to share, and a secondly, a church to belong to. Just for a short, short moment, as we move through these verses, I want to encourage you about what Jesus says about the church in verse 18. We read this, and I tell you, Jesus says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You may have come across someone who in discussion about faith says this about the church, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, but I don't need the church. And unfortunately, there are many reasons that lead people to turn their back on the church. And only too often, the fault can lie with those within the church. But I want to encourage you today about your relationship with Jesus' people, Jesus' 
church. And that's what we read here, that the church that was built on the life and testimony of the Apostle Peter is Jesus' church. Jesus says, I will build my church. The church is not a human invention. It's Christ church that he has given to us as a source of vital support and growth and encouragement for our Christian lives. It's not something that we should just take or leave depending on how we are feeling. God wants us to see his people as a unique gift from him. And so as we share in communion, as we pause and eat and drink, we are reminded reminded of what unites us as God's people, what unites us as Christ's church. And it's the cross of Christ. And so as we share in communion in a few moments, can I encourage you to give thanks for God's people. Give thanks for the church family that sits around you, this people of God that you belong to, that you are united to through the cross of Christ. Give thanks for God's people. A confession to share, a church to belong to, and thirdly, a cross to cling to. If you have watched or enjoy a Hollywood action movie. If, if you have any streaming service, you'll know that um, when you click on it, it kind of comes up with favorites or those movies that they've worked out that you would like to watch. And Jackie, she flicked on to one of our, the ones that we subscribe to and up came lots of action movies. And she said, oh, obviously you've been watching some. Jackie's not into her action movies, but I enjoy a good action movie. And if you're like me, you will have encountered a storyline like this. A hero, the hero of the movie, doing all that they can to rescue or keep safe a loved one, to save them from the baddies of the movie. The hero doing all that they can to rescue or keep safe a loved one, to keep them safe from the baddies of the movie. And I was watching a movie the other night that involved a hero literally jumping off a building in his attempts to keep the baddie away from his daughter. Nothing was going to stop him. Nothing was going to get in his way. He was going to save and protect his loved one. If you were to keep on ramping up, that storyline up and up, you might get to the story of the cross eventually. A story that we find weaving itself through the pages of Scripture, beginning in Genesis, and it tells us that nothing was going to stop God. Nothing was going to get in His way. He had promised to rescue His people through the death of Jesus on a cross, and that is what he was going to do. And as we come to Matthew 16 to verse 21, and Jesus begins to share with the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. In many ways, these verses in Matthew 16 are much closer to the end of the story than the beginning. And it may be a new road of discovery for the disciples. But for any reader of the Bible who's reading it from the beginning to the end, they've already spent thousands of years getting to this point of God's rescue plan. It's no surprise. They've read of God's promises of blessing through Abraham. They've read of a descendant of David reigning forever. They've read of prophets like Isaiah speaking of a baby being born and a servant dying. And along this long road, there was potential for setback again and again as God's people rejected his rule, rejected his promises. As in many ways, humanity sought to thwart God's plan. But nothing could stop God. There is no other way. Jesus is the one and only, as we thought about last week, the only way truth, and life. And God's plan for your salvation is one that speaks of your unique value to Him, of His amazing love and grace for you. 
speaks of a God who gave everything so that you might know forgiveness and life and adoption into his family. God's plan speaks of your safety within his arms, of his devotion to you. And so as we pause through communion, I encourage you to give thanks for the cross and cling to it. We've had a confession to share, a church to belong to, a cross to cling to, and finally, a calling to live by. And I want to just leave you with one final thought for our time during communion. And if you share Peter's confession of who Jesus is, then what does that mean for your day-to-day lives? Well, Jesus doesn't leave with any, us with any questions about what it looks like to follow him day by day. We are to follow in the way of the cross. And that involves death, death to self, death to selfish whims and thoughts and desires and hopes and actions, death to self and life in Jesus. And so during our time of communion, there's just one more area of prayer and consideration for you. What does it mean for you to deny yourself and take up your cross. And we might find ourselves thinking that in following Jesus, we don't need to or want to consider this. However, Jesus says, we must deny ourselves. We face the real danger that we are not following Jesus if we are not taking seriously Jesus' call in these verses. And the challenge to each of our hearts comes in Jesus' words, our lives are at stake. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? In these coming moments of reflection on the cross, they give us just a unique opportunity to consider a confession to share, a church to belong to, a cross to cling to, and a calling to live by. And just as we turn our thoughts towards the cross, we're going to sing together. We're going to stand and sing and give us an opportunity to respond to these verses as we stand to sing, O oh Jesus, I have promised. <laughs>
to begin to turn our thoughts towards sharing in communion. But just as we do that, it gives me just a joy to, to, to welcome a, a new member on transfer from Eglinton Presbyterian in North Belfast. I want to remember, I welcome Paula. Paula, I, I said I wasn't going to get you to do anything. I just, this is Paula. You can l- give us a little wave there, Paula. I'll give everybody a little wave. Um, so it's been wonderful. Paula moved to, to Anne McGee back in the springtime. It's been great to have her uh, part of our church family. You're really welcome, Paula, to our church family. But there have also been a number of new faces in our church family over the last number of months. As I have got to know them, I can assure you that they are nice people. And so I would really want to encourage you, if you look around our church family, and there may be some faces that you don't No, maybe those faces have been here a long time or they have joined in the last number of months. I'd really encourage you to take the opportunity to introduce yourself to them and get to know each other, those new faces that might be around. As as we come to share in communion, I want to give an invitation to you from Jesus, an invitation that if you know and love the Lord, to share in this meal together. As we share communion together, this is not the table of Ian McGee Presbyterian. It's the table of our Lord Jesus. And with that comes an invitation to each person here who loves the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a member of our own congregation or another, to join in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And if you're here with us and don't yet know Jesus as Savior and King, of your life. We're so pleased that you're here. And our prayer is as you are present with us during communion, that you maybe even for the first time might see the amazing significance of Jesus' death for you. We hope that you would feel comfortable in just passing along the bread or wine if it comes to you. But we want to turn to God's Word. We want to turn to Matthew 27. As we hear the events of the cross, I'm going to invite Mary to come and read to us from Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verses 45 to 54. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tomb after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, They were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Amen. Let's stand to sing, There is a green hill far away.
of God's people, the church, what we share together, I want to invite you to read along with myself the Apostles' Creed, truths that unite us in Christ. Let's read together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. According to the example and command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as a memorial of him, we do this. The night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he spoke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray together as we come to share communion. Come to God's table, for all is prepared. The bread that we offer is broken and shared. Christ's presence among us is food for the soul, reviving, renewing, and making us whole. Fathers, we come to share in this meal together. You know us. You know our hearts and minds today. Father, you know the work that has to be done in each of our lives, whether that is a work of repentance, whether that is a work of renewing, whether that is a, a work of reassurance, whether that is a work of grace and strength for us. Father, we invite you to come and do a work among us as we share in this meal of remembrance together. Come to God's table. We come as we are. We bring all the burdens we've carried so far, in body, in spirit, in soul, mind, and heart, to feed on the grace only God can impart. <coughs> Amen. Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me.
take, eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him. Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. This cup is the new covenant in his blood. Drink from it in remembrance of him. Let's pray together 
and say the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and close our service in song by singing a song that we sang at the beginning of our service. O my soul arise and bless your maker.